All right, so, <coughs> so when you stick them in a respirator, which remember is a tray of water, and what's going to happen is that, remember, that water is going to move in. It's going to move in until the pressure, air pressure, inside the respirator is equal to the water pressure, and therefore it will stop. Then when these seeds are doing cellular respiration, remember they take in O2, take out, uh, release CO2, but the CO2 is not going to go back into this volume of gas in the respirometer. The CO2 is going to react with the KOH to form a white solid. So if we look at the equation on the board for cellular respiration, six oxygens go in and six CO2s go out. So for every oxygen that goes in, a CO2 comes out, but it's not going to enter into that and it's going to react with the KOH. So what's going to happen in our lab is we left off on Monday talking about the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And so remember, R is always a constant. We are going to try and have a constant temperature. Um, in these, uh, these trays, tonight before I leave, I'm going to fill them with water. And that way, the water will um, come to room temperature. So if the tap water is colder than the room temperature, it'll become room temperature. So therefore, we're going to try and control the temperature as much as we can. And so the temperature hopefully will stay the same. So then what's going to happen is as respiration is going on here, they're, they're going to take an O2, but not going to replace it with anything because the CO2 is going to react with the KOH. So what's going to happen to N in our respirator? It's going to go down. And, and when N goes down, so you're going to have less gas molecules in here, what's going to happen to the pressure? It's also going to go down. So this side is also going to go down. So there, therefore, the pressure, the air pressure inside the respirometer is going to go down because the molecules are going down, which means that the water is going to move in. And remember, this is measured in milliliters, so we can actually measure um, where it started out. So like, let's say this was 0.9 milliliters, and this is, it went to 0.85 milliliters. We could say that it took in 0.05 milliliters of oxygen in whatever time period, let's say it was two minutes, all right, that, that happened. And so we could say, okay, 0 0.05 milliliters of oxygen consumed in your given time period, let's say it was two minutes, all right? So then I can figure out per minute by reducing that and see how much milliliters of oxygen is consumed per minute. And that's what we're doing to measure the rate of cellular respiration. So then, in most experiments, we also do a control group. And so this has seeds in it, to give you an example here. The control group, in the reading that we did on, um, on Monday, gave an example of what you could use for a control respirometer. Does anybody remember what they said? It's been a couple of days. We want um, something, we're measuring cellular respiration. So we want something that is, um, will not do cellular respiration. Well, they said glass beads. That's right. They said glass beads. So glass beads, if you have a respirometer that has glass beads in it, the glass beads uh, uh, will take up space in the respirometer like the seeds, um, but will not be doing cellular respiration. So if I have, I'll do a different color here, pretend like it's laying on the ground here. If I have a second respirometer here, and I set it up exactly the same way as the KOH and the cotton with the KOH, the non-absorbent cotton, but I have glass beads here and I set this respirometer in. Hopefully we would all say that the glass beads would not do cellular respiration, right? Glass beads are not alive, so they're not doing cellular respiration. So water will go in, just like they did in this pipette here, water will go in and so we would not expect the water to move in the glass beads due to gas exchange due to cellular respiration. But sometimes the water will move in the glass beads, and therefore we need to account for that. So what I want to talk about is what's gonna, what could make the water move in this glass bead respirometer besides cellular respiration. Some years, why do you see that the glass beads move in? Sometimes they move in, the water moves in. Sometimes it moves 
out, it does different things. It can be caused by one of two different things, or a combination of both of them. Scott? Uh, outside air pressure, maybe? Absolutely, the outside <coughs> air pressure. The atmosphere has a pressure that it exerts on every single thing on the Earth. So therefore, right now, on us, on everything on Earth, the, the pressure of the air is going to be um, exerted on even our water bath. So what happens is this atmospheric pressure, does it always stay the same? No, it can change. Have you guys ever heard weather reports where it talk, talks about the pressure is rising, the pressure is falling? This is what they're talking about. When they say the pressure is rising, the pressure is getting greater, which means that the air pressure is pushing with a greater force on things on the earth. So if that's happening, while we do this lab and the pressure is rising, what's the water going to do? Is it going to go into the pipe out or out? If it's pushing. All right, yeah, it will move in and it'll look like the beads are respiring, but they're not. It's due to the change in atmospheric pressure. So therefore, what we would have to do is if our beads went in a little bit, if in, in our seeds went in more, what we have to do is say, okay, yeah, our seeds went in 0 0.05, but so do the beads, so we have to subtract whatever the beads are doing. We can't count what the beads are doing because whatever they're doing is due to something else besides cellular respiration. And so therefore, the true amount of oxygen is um, uh, taking away anything that the actual beads do. Um, sometimes, I've seen in years past, not all the time, but in years past, I've seen where the water goes out. What's going on here? Grayson? The pressure is lowering. So if the atmospheric pressure lowers, then it is changing while we are actually during the hour that we're doing the lab. Then as it lowers, there's going to be less water pressure, and therefore the water is going to move out. All right, and so lower uh, when the atmospheric pressure lowers, that's usually when a storm front's coming in. And so I've had years past where a, a storm was moving in. It was literally moving in, and the pressure was falling greatly, and we've seen water go out like that. All right, so just depends upon what's going out on outside at the time. Um, I don't think it's supposed to. We're supposed to have Model. So we probably won't see it going out, but we may see it going in. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, so that's the purpose of that. So if the atmospheric pressure, this, the second thing that could change it is if your your water temperature is changing. It shouldn't because it's been sitting overnight. But if by chance your water temperature changes, do you see where the if PV equals nRT, if the temperature changes, that's going to change the pressure and volume on the inside of the responder, and so that could change things as well. All right, so we're going to try and keep that temperature constant. Um, so therefore, that's what the purpose of the beads are. All right, so what we're going to do is, um, the sheet that you picked up here today, get that out. I'm going to introduce a, a little bit of uh, some things that you need to know before we get to the lab. Um, so that you can understand the questions that we are going to address here. So, so this this few slides here, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna introduce this thing called biosynthesis and um, oops, sorry, I have to go back. Sorry, right here. Bioenergetics. <coughs> so the overall flow and transformation of energy in an animal. So it determines how much food an animal needs to get the amount of energy it needs. Because remember, when you break down food, you're going to get energy to make ATP, and that's used to do cellular processes. So it determines how much food an animal needs, and it relates to an animal's size, activity, and environment. So we're going to see that how big an animal is, um, will change its rate of cellular respiration and how much ATP it is, uh, needs. Um, its activity, the more active they are, the more cellular respiration, therefore the more energy they need, um, and also their environment. So the metabolic rate, the amount of energy an animal uses in a unit of time. And the 
this rate can be determined by measuring an animal's heat loss or the amount of oxygen consumed or carbon dioxide released or produced. So really this metabolic rate, how much energy an animal uses in a unit of time is the rate of cellular respiration. So when it says it can be uh, measured by an animal's heat loss, remember energy is released and that energy is used to make ATP, but remember a lot of that energy during cellular respiration is released as heat as well. So we can measure heat loss, we can measure the amount of oxygen consumed or the amount of CO2 produced. We are measuring, remember, the amount of oxygen consumed in our lab. So when we look at animals, there's a relationship between the size and the metabolic rate. So metabolic rate is proportional to body mass to the power of three quarters. So m to the third, three quarter, three fourths power. Let's look at this in a graph here. So if we look here at the graph on the left here, graph A, along the x-axis is the body mass. So from small to large, and. <laughs> Along the y-axis, it says BMR. Um, BMR is the basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is the bare minimum uh, rate of cellular respiration that an organism needs to stay alive. So it's like you're resting. So for us, it would be like maybe when we're sleeping, where you're not using a lot of energy. It's just the bare minimum, uh, and so on. And notice here, while we're measuring it, it says in liters of oxygen per hour. So how much oxygen is consumed per time period gives you a rate of how much cellular respiration is occurring. We're doing milliliters of oxygen per minute, so it's a smaller period in our lab, but it's the same idea. So um, if we look here at the different organisms, you can see it's going from large to small. So shrew, mouse, and so on is obviously smaller than an elephant. Uh, Madeline. Isn't the bare minimum of the oxygen oxygen? Well, it's kind of, it's oxygen, but then oxygen is used to make ATP for energy, so therefore it's kind of both. Yeah. So if we look here, we can see that as body mass increases, the um, amount of oxygen consumed per hour also increases. And you would probably be able to tell me that. You would expect that a mouse uses less oxygen per hour um, than an elephant. Why? Because the, um, uh, <coughs> the mouse has less tissue all right, than the elephant. So then let's look at this graph here, which has a very different curve. Look, the x-axis is exactly the same. So the x-axis here, the body mass, um, is, uh, goes up here. And then it's also basal metabolic rate, but look at here, it says it's per kilogram. So the relationship of the basal metabolic rate per kilogram of body mass. So here, as showing you here, liters of oxygen per hour, which is the same as here, but it's also per kilogram. What does that mean? It means, so this one says, okay, big old elephant, how much oxygen do they consume per hour? Little old mouse, how much oxygen they consume per hour? So the elephant does more, uh, takes in more than the mouse. Here, what this means is if you took that big old elephant and you took one kilogram of tissue from that elephant, and you took your little old mouse and took one kilogram of tissue from that mouse, so we have the same mass, kilogram for kilogram, what we find is that the smaller organism has a way higher metabolic rate than the larger organism, gram per gram, all right? And so therefore, if you think about, um, so they're doing cellular respiration at a much faster rate with the smaller organism. And so <coughs> if you think about if you've pets, have you ever felt their heart rate? It's much higher than ours. Have you ever felt a small animal's heart rate? All right, much heart, uh, higher than ours. Think about this, they're doing cellular respiration, gram for gram, at a higher rate. Um, and so what happens, what does your heart do? Your heart pumps blood throughout your body. Um, the blood carries your oxygen and food to the cells. And so that little mouse, um, because their cells are doing cellular respiration at a much greater rate, their heart has to pump at a much greater rate to get that uh, glucose and oxygen to those cells. Does that make sense? All right. So, <coughs> so, so the next slide puts this in words, what I just explained here. So, larger animals have more body mass and therefore require more chemical energy. 
with the graph A showed. Smaller uh, animals have higher metabolic rates per gram. Again, the per gram is important than larger animals. So that higher metabolic rate of smaller animals, gram per gram, leads to a higher oxygen delivery rate, higher breathing rate, heart rate, usually greater um, blood volume compared with a larger animal. To get that, all those things needed for cellular respiration to those cells in a timely manner. So for example, each gram of mouse requires about 20 times as many calories as a gram of elephant tissue. Even though the whole elephant uses far more calories as an organism than the mouse because it just has more kilograms, right? more grams. And so, <coughs> so these animals take in these chemical energies um, from their food. They um, make ATP, which powers cellular work. And then remember, not all the food that you take in actually is used for cellular respiration after the needs of staying alive are met. Remaining food molecules can be used in biosynthesis, the making of living things or living molecules. Um, the biosynthesis includes body growth, repair, and storage of materials such as fat. So we do store excess food molecules that we eat. And that's what this picture is showing you here. So here is showing you here's your molecules that you eat. You don't get all the energy and the food molecules that we eat. We digest and absorb. Um, those reactions release a little bit of heat. Nutri nutrient molecules get to the body cells used for cellular respiration. When cellular respiration happens, some energy is released as heat. Some is used to make ATP. Some is used to make molecules and store molecules in our cells. ATP is broken down for cellular work and to make molecules. And all these reactions release heat energy. Also notice something that we haven't talked about is some of the food that you eat, you actually never actually absorb. And so it goes right through your body. Remember we talked about cellulose and fiber goes right through the body. So we have energy that's lost in our feces that we never digest and get into our bodies. Um, so therefore that's a portion of what we um, don't eat. And then um, some uh, nitrogenous waste that's urine. All right, so we have some things that are excreted out in our urine. And um, that's some of that energy. Okay? And then it's just showing you here this arrow, biosynthesis. So, for example, glycogen. When we eat glucose, some of that glucose is used for cellular respiration. Some of it is used to make glycogen, which is a storage of um, glucose. And eventually we can break that down to be used for nutrients later on. Okay? And so, <coughs> so that's the background information for the lab. So now our lab. What we're going to do is, we looked at, and I gave you information about animals. So animals, the bigger the body mass, the higher the metabolic rate, or gram for gram, all right, um, the bigger the animal, well, gram for gram, has a lower metabolic rate than a smaller animal. And what we're going to do is see if that same uh, rule applies to plants, and we're going to use our seeds, all right? So that's what you're going to look at. So... <coughs> Let me show you the two questions. All right, so um, uh, these are the two questions. Um, do seeds with a higher mass have a higher metabolic weight? So that would be like the elephant had the higher mass and um, the, the shrew had a lower mass. Um, and so we saw that the larger animal has a um, higher metabolic rate. Does that apply for seeds? And then the second question is the gram per gram. Is the metabolic rate per gram of tissue lower in a seed with greater overall mass? So if you have a big seed and a small seed, but if you looked at it gram per gram, um, does that big seed have a lower uh, uh, metabolic rate? All right, so <coughs> I'm going to um, uh, let you guys choose your question, all right, that you want to, so in your group, you're going to choose which one that you would like um, to do. I'm going to give you that um, option, and then <coughs> what you're going to, what, what the rest of the hour that you're going to do is, I'll put this back up in just a second here, and you're going to get, oh, okay, right here. So, 
So I have given, so today's agenda, I have given you, because I brought this to you, uh, on Monday, the sheet here, this is an example lab. I gave this to you so that you can read this and use um, to help you to design your lab. This is a, the, the, the respirometers and kind of the overall idea of setting it up is very similar to what you're going to do. They're just testing different questions. So when you read through this, they're testing instead of these two, the two questions that I just looked at are, showed you, they're, they're testing the cellular respiration occur greater in warmer temperatures versus colder temperatures. So they're changing the temperature. Um, you guys are not changing the temperature. It's all going to be room temperature. You guys are going to um, test those two, one of those two questions that I just put up here. But I want you to look at this and um, to give you some ideas, all right, as far as hints and things like that to you. So then it says design your lab. It says you will have available to you. Um, each group, I have enough for each group to have three respirometers. Um, in all the things that are used to make the responses. The cotton, KOH is going to be in a liquid form um, that you can put drops in the cotton ball. And your age group is going to have one tray with water. You can put multiple responders in the water. You have three different types of seeds. You don't have to use all the seeds. So there's peas, mung beans, and rye seeds. I put the trays up here and label them so that you can see what they look like if you'd like to come and look at them. So I'll open them up here. I have them sitting here. So you can take a, take a look at that. Um, also, I have an example respirometer if you want to take a look at that and, and see what that looks like. The tray, it's a very simple tray here. This is what they look like. It's filled with water here um, tomorrow. And you'll have a graduated cylinder available to you. I'm going to have you look in that example lab and to see what the graduated cylinder would be used for. All right. So, and then today, the rest of the hour, you're going to work on your design. I'll be walking around um, if you have any questions or need direction. Uh, and then eventually, before the end of the hour, I want to see get the gist of what you're going to do, um, and then we're going to do the lab tomorrow. Okay. All right. So go out and get in your groups. Okay. Is it groups of two or four? Four. Okay.